Hello, this is Dr. Kornman, and we're going to talk about how to interpret MRI images. There are contraindications for MRIs. Patients who have metal in their eyes, patients who have clips in their brain, and patients who have spinal cord stimulators or diabetic pumps all need to find whether these are compatible with the MRI. Of course, this isn't your task, but it's important to have the MRI technician note about these so they can determine whether it's safe to have an MRI. The sagittal images are incredibly valuable, but you have to understand what you're looking at. The anatomy of the spine is important because this is revealed in great detail on the MRI. If you remember from various anatomy lectures, the spinal cord continues down until you get to the conus, which ends behind the body of L1. The nerve roots of the cauda equina, which is of course Latin for horse's tail, start to exit around T10 or T11 and come all the way out until the bottom of the conus, S2, 3, and 4. And below the level of L1, this is all the cauda equina coming all the way down the sacrum. The lateral, of course, here demonstrates the cord which ends behind the body of L1, and then you can see the individual nerve roots of the cauda equina. The CSF, of course, is in the canal, and depending on if you're looking at a T1, a T2, or a stir image, as this is, water can be white or black. These are the vertebral bodies. These are the disc spaces. And of course, anterior, you're going to see the aorta and the great vessels coming down, as well as the organs, depending on the collimation of the MRI imaging. There is the foraminal view. So if the central cut is through the center of the canal, if you bring the cut about a centimeter to the side, you're going to see the vertebra in the foramen. So here you can see the vertebral body. You can see the pedicle, the superior facet, you're not far enough lateral yet to see the inferior facet here, but you can see them down here. The foramen consists of the nerve root, which appears to be oval. There are small black dots you can see, which are the vessels, and the white, of course, is fat. And you can always determine if this is going to be fat by looking at the posterior subcutaneous fat and determining if it's the same color. So now we have to talk about three different images that you're going to be reviewing. There are T1 images, T2 images, and stir or inversion recovery images. And they all really form around whether the water and the fat is bright signal or dark. So a T2, very typically, water is white. So you'll see the spinal canal CSF is white. You'll see the intradiscal water is white, and you'll see fat is white. On a stir image, the water is still white. Again, discal water, CSF water, but fat turns dark. So this is a valuable tool to know. And then the difference between T2 and T1, T2 where water is white and fat is white, and T1 where water is black, but fat is still white. On the axial views, you have to remember radiologists are dyslexic. Right is over here, left is over here. So you're actually looking at the spine from the bottom up, not the top down. But we realize radiologists are dysfunctional. So looking at this axial view, this is the disc here. This is the CSF sac of uh, fluid. And you'll notice the sac is dark and water, I'm sorry, and fat is white, so this is going to be a T1 image. If we come over here, where water is white and fat is white, this is going to be the T2 image. If you saw water being white in the disk space and in the CSF, but this is black, of course, that would be a stir image. So now we can understand how to look at these things. We can start to look at pathology to determine whether or not this is a problem. So this is a axial cut through a disc space where you can see 
the nucleus is white because it's hydrophilic. It absorbs water. It's like a giant sponge. The outer part of the disk are 30 rings of collagen, and collagen in its raw form is black. So you can look, and this is a normal-looking disk and normal spinal canal with the nerve roots in the spinal canal. These are the exiting nerve roots on either side. Now we come over here. This is our first pathology. This is an annular tear. So you notice the color of the disc space, which here is white, is now dark. And you can see a tear going right through the annular fibers and even a small disc bulge here. It doesn't compress the nerve roots. I wouldn't expect there to be any buttocks and leg pain, but it does tear through the posterior wall and this patient had some lower back pain. Now, we can also use the MRIs to determine what the natural history of an annular tear is. If we look at the lateral here, this is a midline view for the most part, and we can see the discs are nicely hydrated here, here, and here, but this looks a little ragged. The disc is a little collapsed, and there's a posterior bulge with a bright signal in the back. This is an annular tear. One year down the road, the same patient you can see the nucleus is no longer absorbing water, so the disc turns black. This is a signal that this is a degenerative disc, and you can see a posterior disc bulge here. So this is the result of an annular tear at one year. There are different grades of degenerative change. This may be a mild to moderate degenerative disc, but these are mild degenerative discs. How can you tell? Well, you can compare them to normal discs where the signal in normal discs is brighter than these two and the posterior wall is slightly bulged out versus normal, which is flat. So these are mild degenerative disc changes versus a moderate degenerative disc change. Well, you'll notice the disc height is dropped. There's signal in the posterior annulus and a posterior bulge. So patients can have multi-level degenerative changes. These are two moderate degenerative discs. These are mild degenerative discs. They look reasonably intact in height, but you compare the signal in these two discs to the signal in these two discs, and you'll compare and see that these are diminished. So these do have some mild degenerative changes. Versus this patient who has a normal disc at L1-2, and 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 1 are all quite degenerative, and you can actually see annular tears through these posterior annuli here. Now, degenerative disc disease is probably genetic in many patients. This is a 15-year-old who complains of back pain and some buttocks pain. You'll notice the discs don't look healthy even normally, but you get down, this is a quite degenerative disc with a posterior disc bulge and even a herniation. And this is a degenerative change with a tear through the anterior annulus here. So this is an indication that degenerative changes of the discs can be genetic in origin also. Annular tears, of course, are what start the process of degenerative changes of the disc. And this is a disc here at L4-5, even L5-S1, where there's annular tears and posterior bulges, period. Here is an annular tear through the lateral aspect of the disc. You can see the left side of the disc appears to be intact, but the right side has a tear through and through and a small posterior bulge in the foramen. Discs can degenerate to the point where they no longer absorb shock and become mechanically incompetent. So here are some probable mild degenerative changes or normal discs. But then you get to this one and you notice that the disc itself is flat. You lose these beautiful end plates that are typically smooth and unbroken. And you'll see they look ragged here. You can see irregularities, almost a sawtooth pattern and this is isolated disc resorption, where the impact of one vertebra on the next is going to create fractures of the end plates. You can also see swelling from the white of the disc space that go into the vertebral bodies, that this is reaction to the increased stress of the disc. 
This is a typical problem called type 1 changes, and they're known as modic changes from the radiologist who discovered them. Schurman's dis disease has to do with adolescence. The end plates of the vertebra before we're skeletally mature are open, and that's what causes the vertebral heights to become larger. Now, in some kids, these end plates are softer and subject to injury. So especially on athletes who have this type of disorder, they'll have end plate fractures. These are called Schmorl's nodes, but you'll notice this vertebra is also wedged. The end plates are irregular, and it increases the kyphosis. And this is a typical Schurman's type uh, change in the vertebral end plate. Now, once you start to get instability, you can have shifting of the vertebra. So typically, even in degenerative discs, the vertebra line up nicely. But you'll see a shift here. The back of this vertebra does not match the back of that vertebra. This is shifted forward, and there's a posterior disc bulge. So this is a spondylolisthesis. We can't determine whether this is an ismic or a degenerative. Of course, ismic where you have a pars fracture, degenerative where you have the facets wear out. But because there's central stenosis, more likely this is going to be degenerative than an ismic spondylolisthesis. I like to look at something called the crescent sign. So the facets, if you look, typically line up, even a degenerative facet like this, lines up where the fronts line up nicely and the backs line up nicely. But if you ignore the arrow for now and you notice the back of this facet here does not match the back of that facet there. In fact, this facet is subluxed into the canal. And there's something called a crescent sign. If you follow the crescent here, you'll find that these line up nicely, but you follow the crescent here and there's a step off. You can see the step off more clearly over here. And that indicates that this facet is subluxed anteriorly. That's an indication of a degenerative spondylolisthesis. So the crescent sign here again, where you can follow this line and it lines up nicely with the facet. You follow this line and it abruptly ends into the facet joint itself. And again, this is a degenerative spondylolisthesis. And this subluxation creates a condition called lateral recess stenosis. Here, this nerve root looks to be free, but you can see this nerve root is under duress. And if you imagine as the patient stands up, this can move forward. That can trap the nerve root and create buttocks and leg pain. So degenerative spondylolisthesis, as this one is, can create central narrowing. And the central narrowing creates stenosis. So here's an example where you have degenerative facet disease and the spinal canal is quite narrowed and the nerves are compressed. Now, if you remember from our talk earlier, the nerves are more compressed the more you stand upright and are less compressed the more you bend forward. So one of the signs of central stenosis is a forward flexed stance. Again, this is a normal canal. You can see the individual nerve roots here. You can see the facets, which appear to be intact and normal. And then you get to these facets where this is, there's the crescent sign. This facet is subluxed forward. This facet, even though has no crescent sign, is quite degenerative with spur formation out here. And you look at the canal and the canal is narrowed. You don't see the CSF in the canal as easily. And there's very little space. This is central stenosis due to a degenerative spondylolisthesis. Again, lateral recess stenosis. You can have that even if you don't have a crescent sign. There is a degenerative spur that's grown out into this facet. This on the right side is normal, on the left is narrowed, and that's lateral recess stenosis. You can have ganglion or synovial cysts. So as the facet degenerates, it can form a cavity that is full of synovial fluid and this can create a compressive lesion just like anything else can. So here you see synovial facet cyst here. Here you see the ganglion or synovial cyst here. The right side is open, the left side is compressed. 
you'd expect to see some left-sided root symptoms on this side and probably the L4 root, maybe the L5 root. Just to remind you that the MRIs are performed with the patient lying down, even though the spine is straight upright, the patient is lying on their back. So here's an example of a ganglion cyst, but there's a fluid level in it. And you see the fluid line goes up and down because in reality, if you turn this 90 degrees, so the spine is in this direction, that would be the fluid level of this particular ganglion cyst. Here's another ganglion or synovial cyst. Oh, there is a difference between disc herniations. Some disc herniations are contained or subligamentous, and other disc herniations are extruded and have no boundary. So here is a tear through the posterior annulus and a disc herniation, but you'll notice this ligament which is stretched here. So this herniation is contained within the posterior longitudinal ligament versus this which is an irregular ragged piece sitting free floating in the canal. This is torn through both the posterior annulus and the posterior longitudinal ligament and this is a free fragment or extruded disc herniation. There are times MRIs can be quite valuable to determine unusual function. So here is a normal lumbar lordosis until we get to the L4-5 level where the disc is in kyphosis. You can't see 5-1, but assume this is also in lordosis. So what would cause an angular change of just one disc level? And of course, it's going to be a disc herniation compressing the structures in the back of the canal. If you have a compressive lesion, the patient is going to want to open the canal up as much as they can and that's going to cause forward flexion. So this particular kyphotic disc is due to a disc herniation or antalgia. You can have double densities, again, remembering that the patient is lying down. So here's a disc herniation, but you follow this line here, and this is an elevated posterior longitudinal ligament, and that's due to this double density of disc herniation here and blood here. Blood will cause a space occupying lesion. Disc herniations won't typically absorb away, but the blood will. So if you see a sign like this, it's a better prognosis in general. Now here's a typical disc herniation on the axial view. See on the left side, the lateral recess is open. This is the nerve root. The exiting nerve is here. And on the right side, you have this mass here compressing the right nerve root, and this is going to probably cause a radiculopathy. Now there's something called foraminal or far lateral disc herniations, which won't be visible on the typical axials. You have to go out to the foramen, where here is a typical nerve root, which is oblique and roundish. They can look like dumbbells occasionally, but you can see it's surrounded by white fat here. And we get to this level and you can't distinguish the nerve root that's because you have a disc herniation in the foramen. On the axial views on the right side, this is a normal nerve root surrounded by white fat. You can, you can take a look at this image and see this is T1. And on the left side, you'll see a disc herniation here, which is compressing the nerve root, which is displaced out to the lateral aspect due to this disc herniation. Again, another foraminal disc herniation, normal above, normal below, and a space occupying lesion in the foramen. And here is the typical sign on the right. The nerve root is free and surrounded by fat. On the left, this nerve root is compressed by this disc herniation. And we know this is a T2 image because water is white and fat is white. There are disc herniations which are rare that can injure the conus, but not necessarily injure anything else. So patients who come in with bowel and bladder involvement, you have to make sure an MRI is performed to make sure they don't have a herniation at 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 12, 1, which is going to affect the conus. Remember, conus is central nervous system, so it needs to be addressed much more quickly than nerve root. 
Recurrent herniations occur also. So this is a patient who underwent a microdiscectomy. You can see a little scar formation here and came back in with leg pain sometime later and has a recurrent disc herniation. You can see the changes in the disc space from the prior surgery. And again, here is a recurrent disc herniation at L3-4. Now, there is a medication we can give a patient for MRI reveal called gadolinium. Gadolinium lights things up. So obviously, gadolinium would not be useful in a T2 image. It can be useful in a STIR and especially a T1 image. This is a patient who had continuing leg pain after recovering from a disc herniation. And so if you notice, this is a T1 image and this nerve root right there lights up. If we go two levels up, we look for the nerve root and there the nerve root is lit up here. As you remember, nerve roots start in the back and exit through the side. So this is the same nerve root as here, and this is a radiculitis, so an inflammation of the nerve root versus a radiculopathy or compression of the nerve root. Arachnoiditis is a condition of the cauda equina. In a normal condition, the cauda itself is heavier than water, so when you lie down, the cauda will tend to pool down on the bottom of the canal. But you'll notice you can distinguish the individual nerve roots. Think of the nerve roots as all having negative charge, so they won't typically touch each other. But in arachnoiditis, when the arachnoid membrane is inflamed, the nerves can clump together, and that can cause a permanent condition and valuable to know what to look for. This is foraminal collapse. So here is an angulation probably of about three degrees collapse to the right, and this is a 26 degree angulation collapse to the left. You can imagine the foramen on the right side is nicely open because the pedicles are wide apart, but these pedicles are almost touching. You can imagine the nerve root getting caught in here, and that should cause a radiculopathy, especially when standing. So you wanna know how to look for foraminal stenosis. Again, this foramen here is open. The nerve root is round or oval. You can see some other vessels in here in the white fat. You can see it's starting to get a little tight here, but the root still has room. And you can see this root is tight and you have pressure from the disc side and from the facet side. So this patient had leg pain with standing and walking that was relieved by bending and sitting down. Again, foraminal stenosis can occur at many different levels. So it behooves you to look at the MRI to make sure the fruit is free. This one is. This one is sandwiched between these two bony and ligamentous structures, creating compression of the nerve root. Now, ismic spondylolisthesis will have the same type of slip as the degenerative spondylolisthesis. More commonly, ismic spondylolisthesis occurs at L5-S1, but it can occur at any level in the lumbar spine. You'll see the slip here, and you can see the degenerative disc. Now, if you're looking carefully, you don't wanna miss the fact this patient has had a previous Schurman's disorder. You can see the irregular end plates and the fractures through the end plates here. Now, the reason some patients come in is they've never had back pain, even though they have a slip, but they develop leg pain because foraminal stenosis is quite common with an ismic spondylolisthesis, but it may take time to occur. You can pick up fractures on the sagittal images. So here is the L5-S1 inferior facet and superior facet and here's a fracture right through the pars. And this at L4-5, you can see a fracture through the pars here, where 5-1 appears to be intact. Again, another pars fracture through the L5-S1 facet versus here, 4-5, which is intact. Now, pars fractures initially have a stress reaction before they break. And if you can pick these up and adolescence, this can have a happy ending because these can heal if you put them in a brace and rest them. 
So you can see the normal pars here, and this is a pedicle reaction here at L4. And again, here's a pedicle reaction at L3. Here on the left, I'm sorry, right side, there is no pedicle reaction, but you can see a stress reaction through the pars and pedicle on the left side here. Hematomas show up a little differently than other space-occupying masses. This is a T2 of obviously water is white and fat is white. And this is a hematoma because the posterior longitudinal, I'm sorry, the ligamentum flavum and the inner spinous ligament tore. So this is a hematoma. How do you determine it? Well, you go to a T1 image and you'll see that it lights up because degradation products of, hemos, of hemoglobin, hemosiderin, and other breakdown biliverdin will change colors. And so you can see this is an abnormal mix of colors. And so by looking at this, comparing it to that, this is a hematoma. Now here's another hematoma here compressing the canal. This is the cauda equina. You can tell it's a T1 because water is black. And you can see the different lighting structures here. That's a hematoma compressing the canal. Fractures can be easily ascertained on MRIs. This is what? This is dark water, white fat. So this is a T1 image. And you'll see the fracture of the end plate here. And if you look carefully, there's also a line through here indicating that the ligament and part of the bone has been injured. This is not a typical compression fracture, but a flexion distraction fracture. So MRIs are quite valuable to determine if the fracture is fresh or not. So here's an example. You can see the end plate change here. There's a fracture of L5. This is a T2. Again, water's white, fat is white. And there's no change within the bony structure. But if we go to our stir image, where water is white and fat is black, you can see the increased signal within the vertebral body. And then you can also see that increased signal, I'm sorry, decreased signal on a T1 image. So this is a fresh L5 compression fracture. Now we can compare that to an old fracture. So here is again a T2, water is white, fat is white, and you can see the signal change in this fracture and you're not sure whether this is fresh or not. But if you then go to the stir image, you'll see there's no water within the vertebral body. So this is a nicely healed fracture of L1. Hemangiomas are quite common. When we first had MRI images 40, 50 years ago, we would see these and some of them would be biopsied because we weren't clear what they were. They were all, of course, fatty infiltration. And hemangiomas are quite common, but you have to be able to differentiate them from this, which is metastatic disease. You can see how circumscribed these tumors are, and you'll see the tumors light up on stir images. So you have to be able to differentiate hemangiomas versus metastatic disease. There are other structures that are harder to deduce. I depend upon my radiologist to look for this, but this is a patient who had obviously surgery. You can see the screws here and had these lymph nodes show up. The radiologist was bright and deduced this, and he, this patient was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic anemia or leukemia. Again, I don't want you to forget that you can have a conus injury, that even though you see these degenerative changes, there are no symptoms below. The symptoms are all generated by this posterior disc herniation. You can have other things that occur. Here's a cyst of the conus. This patient was asymptomatic uh, for this particular problem. He had pain from his isolated disc resorption in L4-5. But again, these things can show up. You can have osteomyelitis. One of the signs of osteomyelitis is it goes through the disc space and into the vertebral bodies. So this is a typical L3-4 osteomyelitis. You can see how the vertebra light up due to the inflammatory effects of this. And this is an avascular, I'm sorry, an AVN 
uh, which is a tumor of ves vessels that shows up in the canal. This was treated with radiotherapy. And of course, neurofibromas, they can occur by themselves or they can occur in other disease processes. So be aware of those. And then MS. MS is an inflammatory disease of the central nervous system. And of course, we happen to have the central nervous system in the lumbar spine from the conus and the bottom of the cord. So on this particular view, you'll notice water is white, fat is black. So this is going to be a stir image and you can see the irregular signal change here and here in the cord. This is MS of the distal cord. There are red and white marrow changes on the axial views through the sacroiliac joint. You can see this white and red area. Well, let's call it white and black, of course. And this is typical altitude changes or aging of the fat marrow. So fatty marrow replaces red marrow as we get older. But you have to be able to differentiate that from this, which you look carefully and the white is only on the edges of the vertebra at the sacroiliac joint. You can see erosions here. This is sacroiliitis or inflammation of the sacroiliac joints. And of course, if you remember my previous lecture, these joints occur bilaterally in ankylosing spondylitis. Thank you. You can contact me or you can check the website neckandback.com and studyspine.com for further information.